So you came back to die with your city. No. I came back to stop you. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Fan Rank. I'm your host, Mackenzie, joined by my esteemed colleagues, Andrew and Tim. Guys, if you want to say hi. Hi, I'm Andrew, and I'm playing a Christopher Nolan character. You guess which. <laughs> Let us know in the comments which character you think Andrew is. <laughs> and I'm Tim, hey, Tim, I did not wear a costume today, but I brought a mug that if I talk into it, I sound like great! Wow! <laughs> Convincing Tim and Tim innovative. <laughs> Bravo! <laughs> Welcome, guys, and thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Happy Barbenheimer weekend to all. This is a highly anticipated weekend in cinema. Uh, so we have been chatting with our fans, our our community. Uh, we've been taking polls, taking votes. We will be revealing today what our fans have chosen as the top 10 Christopher Nolan films um, in ranked order as we do. So uh, be sure to stick around. We have a fantastic guest, guest speaker who will be joining us before we reveal our top three to uh, speak a little bit about Oppenheimer, what we can expect, and where this film falls amongst our top 10. So welcome everyone. Let's jump in. All right, at number 10, we have following. That's what it's all about. Interrupting someone's life, making them see all the things that they took for granted. Fitting, fitting, following, <laughs> fitting. coming up at the end. <laughs> yeah, well, I was gonna say, I love that we're opening with his first film. <laughs> yeah. How fitting, how appropriate. Um, Tim, what do you think about following? Uh, this is a great character movie. Uh, I feel like Nicholas, uh, Nicholas Cage, what are we doing? <laughs> so that Nicholas Cage on the brain. We got man. the wrong fan rank. Um, Christopher Nolan movies have kind of lost sight of character. I think this is one of this is the movie that puts character first. Oh, it's a nice haircut, though. Nice suit as well. Look at that butt stuff. Yeah, I feel like with following, we start to see kind of the the makings of what will become the key kind of like parts of his films down the line. We have gritty, kind of morally ambiguous characters. We have twists. We have kind of underbelly energy. Um, great movie. I, I think it makes sense that this is number 10, but uh, if you haven't watched it, you should, and it's only like an hour and 10 minutes. So check it out. He said something about you being a witness to an incident that happened in this very room. Well, he was very precise about exactly how and where I should take care of things. And at number nine, we have Insomnia. Pacino and Williams on the same screen. It feels like it took too long for us to get there, in my opinion. <laughs> this is better than Heat. I mean, in, yeah. my, in my opinion, who cares about Pacino and De Niro? This is where it's at. This is where it's at. You'd see it right away, wouldn't you? You're trying to impress me, Finch, because you got the wrong guy. There is actually kind of a heat dynamic between these guys in this movie. It's double bind, cat and mouse. Um, and one of the best chase scenes that I've ever seen, in my personal opinion. Tim, what do you think of best, Insomnia? Yeah, best running over log scene uh, I've ever seen. <laughs> Absolutely. Top 10 running over log movies. <laughs> <laughs> this guy, he crossed the line and he didn't even blink. Number eight, we have The Dark Knight Rises. Oh, born in darkness. And there it stays at number eight. Uh, I, I heard we have, <laughs> Bane in the house? Bane in the house somewhere? <laughs> we have oh, yes! <laughs> no one cared who I was till I put up the bug. If I pull that off, will you die? It would be extremely painful. You're a big guy. For you. I will well say, done. Dark Knight Rises, I think, definitely was not the end of the trilogy anybody was expecting. I mean, outside circumstances just made it that way. Uh, but there's still some really thrilling parts. Just also scenes where Catwoman kicks the air and people fall down. <laughs> yeah, I'm not. I'm not surprised to see to see this here. I think um, once we get deeper into the rank, we'll see uh, where the love is displaced amongst the other Batman. But. Um, no, I think I'm not surprised to see this here. It is a far, far better rest that I go to than I have ever known. Let's move right along to number seven. At number seven, we have Dunkirk. <laughs> this 
This makes a lot of sense. <laughs> okay, that's interesting. So why do you say it makes sense? I think Dunkirk is, what on what Tim was saying about character, Dunkirk is a movie that really starts cooking when all the characters are in play and all going towards different objectives. But that doesn't happen for about 40 minutes. So <laughs> for that first 40 minutes, it kind of feels like you're watching a documentary and you're like, this is interesting. But it's not until the characters are really in peril, which starts at the 40 minute mark, where you're really invested in the film. So I understand why people aren't, it doesn't grab people as much as other films. You should be at home. Well, there won't be any home if we allow a slaughter across the channel. There seems to be kind of a disparity a little bit between like the, the people and the critics on this, which I get because, and I, I agree with what you're saying, but like this movie was like nominated for eight Oscars for best picture, best director. Um, I was reading critics saying it was one of the greatest war movies ever made. I heard critics saying this was one of, this was Nolan's best film. Um, so, but I'm still not surprised to see it kind of low in the rank. <laughs> yeah, it has that kind of like uh, three uh, intersecting narrative arcs where it's like, okay, Tom Hardy's doing this for an hour. Uh, what is it? The guys in the boat are doing this for like a day or something like that. And then the guys on the ground are doing this for like three days or something, like that, you know? So it's, and it's, it's not until it kind of coalesces that it really starts to pop. Small boats can lurk from the beach. Not in these conditions. Well, I'd rather face waves than dive bombers. I feel like there were some people in the comments that were saying that this movie was a bit underrated. I think there's an argument that maybe it's overrated or, or maybe it's just an outlier in his filmography as a whole that he has so many other kind of, it's, it's just different. But I still think it, it contains that like action blockbuster, but very like emotionally driven story that's like so characteristic of his work. So surprised, but not surprised to see this at seven. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. At number six, we have Batman Begins. What the hell are you? I'm Batman. Surprised? Agree? I think right there, it's right in the middle. I think Batman Begins, what it did for better or worse, was give every superhero origin story the same formula, where you start in the middle and then work your way back and jump in through time. So many people have done that since yeah. Batman Begins. So if you get past the cliches you see every day, it really just is a solid film and a really interesting way to bring you into that Batman world. What do you think? I think you're trying to help. Yeah, and it really did kind of like set the tone as well for a lot of these superhero movies going forward. Uh, whereas we had been in kind of goofy territory with, you know, Blade or X-Men. This kind of, everyone wanted to copy the Batman movies from Christopher Nolan, even if they shouldn't have, like, you know, <laughs> like Superman, uh, you know. So uh, I think that the, this movie's uh, impact and legacy is still being felt today. I never said thank you. And you'll never have to. Number five, we have Memento, middle of the pack. Yo, let me. I thought you split for good. Sammy couldn't pick up any new skills at all. But I find something in my research. It's it's a wild ride. And I think it's one of those movies that as soon as you f know the twist, it if you know the twist or it's leaked, you're not going to have such a great time. <laughs> but um, I think it really, again, it's one of those movies that's so innovative of the jumping back in time, the different narratives. Uh, s sometimes it is a bit confusing. <laughs> I will say, I don't know about you guys. Look, memory can change the shape of a room, it can change the color of a car, and memories can be distorted. Yeah, I mean, uh, unless you have a really good handle on how the two narrative uh, arcs are running alongside each other, it, it could be a little bit like you're playing catch up, but then again, so is the character. So, um, yeah. you know, like every 30 minutes, he's like, okay, wait, hang on, kill this guy, <laughs> don't kill this guy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so actually, I think it's, it works in kind of a meta way in that sense. 
I totally agree. I think his reality is obfuscated and confusing and nonlinear. And like, that's how we experience the film also. I, I think it makes total sense. And, and, and like you were, well, it makes total sense. Like it, it works. <laughs> um, I also think uh, much like following, this is kind of where we see these these uh, these themes of like time and memory and reality and truth. Like Nolan, I feel like he's really working out those ideas in this film and we see him explore those in way more depth and with way bigger budgets in movies like Interstellar um, and in Inception. So it's like, I'm excited to talk about those also, but I feel like this is like, Memento is one of my favorite of his movies. I would put this higher in my own rank, but um, it's hard to compare that with the, I think the bigger, in all senses of the word, movies that come later. <laughs> I should kill you. Quit it, Lenny, come on. You're not a killer. Okay, so number four, we have The Prestige. Oh, uh, yeah. What a turn, I, what a turn. <laughs> yeah, what a twist, yeah. <laughs> Are you man enough, sir? Yes. I was amazed to see how much love um, this was getting in the comments and from our fans that were reaching out and saying like, this is the movie, this is underrated. I do feel like this falls through the cracks a bit when we talk about Christopher Nolan's of, but it has a very devoted fan base. Um, what do you guys think of this movie? M. Night Shyamalan must love it because it is <laughs> full of twists every minute. And I think it, it is really fun to see these two magicians kind of one-upping each other in really brutal ways each and every time it just gets worse. And I think people forget about it because it gets so twisty. It's almost becomes a parody of itself for a while, but it does end <laughs> on one of, like, one of the best endings of a Christopher Nolan film. So yeah. it, it, does, it does get there in the, the end, but I can see where people going along this journey are a little turned around <laughs> well it's cool because the story's three act like the script's three act structure mirrors the three acts of the illusions that it's about like the pledge the turn and the prestige like in the end and I, so i was kind of reading about how nolan was like struggling to find like real life like ways to play out this structure or like real life in the film um, to kind of translate this literary device into something that feels like real. Um, I kind of agree that the twists start to feel um, not predictable because you don't know what's going to happen, but just in the sense that you know there will be another twist because every <laughs> 15 minutes <laughs> there's a new twist. But um, no, I think this is a really like this is a really strong movie. Um, I think it's cool. Man's reach exceeds his imagination. All right, folks, before we reveal our top three, I would love to, I'm delighted to introduce our special guest for today, Mr. Nick Spake. He is a fantastic writer, critic, and has been one of Watch Mojo's top writers for many years. So let's please welcome him to the show. And uh, please stick around because we're going to be revealing our top three Christopher Nolan movies as chosen by the fans. So we'll see you in a second. What's next? One. Hi, Nick. How's it going? Hey, it's going great. Thanks for having me here to talk about Barbie. Ooh! Yeah. <laughs> Thanks Chris for joining Nolan us. Barbie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What would that film look like? <laughs> I'd like to say it's upper tier Greta Gerwig, but uh, really we're here to talk about Nolan, so let's get it right on yeah. that. <laughs> All right, so you have seen Oppenheimer. Can you tell us a bit about the film with no spoilers? What can we expect? Yes, well, you know, it's history, so I don't know how spoiler heavy it's going to be. But, uh, <laughs> how does it end? <laughs> Why? How about because this is the most important thing to ever happen in the history of the world? You're the great improviser, but this, you can't do in your head. I think at least most people know that it involves an explosion, and it's a very important explosion in history. And uh, at this point, you know, we're kind of desensitized to seeing explosions in film because we see them in virtually every summer blockbuster, but Nolan does something really impressive with this film. He makes an explosion that's both awe-inspiring and horrifying at the same time. And part of that's because he executes it practically. The real reason though is because we really feel the explosion that's brewing within the titular character. And after the explosion comes the aftershock within Oppenheimer, the character, and the person, which is where the real meat of the story is. And also, this is probably Killian Murphy's 
This is the performance of his career, I'd say. He's been working with Nolan for years, and he's been one of our most underrated actors, and he's finally getting center stage. And, you know, even though this is probably his most dialogue-heavy role, and Nolan's most dialogue-heavy film, it's really what's going on beneath the surface of Murphy's performance that really carries the film and makes for an interesting character study. Right. Okay, because I think that is kind of the magic of Nolan, is that he can have these enormous action sequences that are still so emotionally charged. So I actually think, I, I kind of had a feeling that even, um, like, even though he has done these big, like, blockbustery films, I think he can handle this story with tact, and I'm, I'm very excited to see the film, and you're, you're corroborating a lot of the things that I, I was hoping it to be. So my next question for you, Nick, is where would you rank Oppenheimer amongst the films that we have listed so far? Top three or sandwiched between what we already have? This is definitely top tier Nolan. Uh, I would personally rank Memento higher on this list, but I would say that this is probably his most epic film, but not in the way that you might think. It doesn't have as many set pieces as Dark Knight or Inception, which I think are top tier, absolute top tier Nolan, but uh, it's, you know, epic in a different way. In many ways, it's kind of what the Irishman is to Scorsese, who's made better films, but it's probably his most epic film, I'd say. Mm -hmm. So I'd say it's probably in top five at the very least, could possibly even be top three. And I can't wait to see what we have, although I have a good idea about where it's, where, uh, you know, the top three is going to go now. So you're saying at no point does someone attempt a heist of the atomic bomb, like no one in clown masks tries to just haul it away with some clever talk and dialogue in a suit. Does that not happen? Oh, well, no. Spoilers. Well, oh, sorry, sorry. I didn't, I didn't want to ruin it for everybody. Obviously, <laughs> Vane made up with the atomic bomb. Oh, yeah. yeah. Vane did it. <laughs> if anyone's going to do it. <laughs> Vane did it first. And then he'll, and that, you know, hold the atomic bomb. Are we saying there's a chance that when we push that button, we destroy the world? Chances are near zero. Near zero. What do you want from theory alone? Zero would be nice. Nick, I got one more question before you say goodbye. You already mentioned you put Memento higher. Is there anything else you would change about the list as we have ranked it so far? Do you hard disagree with any of our fan comments? Hard disagree, I wouldn't say. I might place uh, Dunkirk a little higher, though. I realize that people either like the prestige or they really love the prestige. I've yet to meet someone that's really like said, oh, prestige is totally his worst movie, but uh, yeah. I would say that this is a really solid rank so far, and it's good to see following get some love because since it's his first film, it's the one that a lot of people always forget about, but it's one you gotta go back and watch. Uh, I think it's on Tubi now, so you can watch it for free, so you have no excuse. There is no excuse. <laughs> Amazing. Well, thank you for joining us, Nick. This was an absolute pleasure. Um, happy Bob and Barbenheimer weekend, and uh, we'll be in touch later. Have a good day. Thanks for having me. Cheers. You are the man who gave them the power to destroy themselves. And the world is not prepared. Eight. Seven. Six. Five. Four. All right. So let's have a look at our rank so far. Let's see how we feel. <laughs> Tim, if you could change one thing about this rank, if this was your thing, no fans included, this is Tim's rank, what would you change here? Okay, well, I'll be the contrarian here and say I would drop the prestige down a few marks. Uh, as as twisty as it is, uh, I think it's not quite as convincing as some of his other movies. Um, but other than that, I kind of like how this looks. I like how it, his it's varied among his uh his years his filmography it because it, he's been very consistent as much as he's evolved so i like how it's not just like late stuff early stuff middle stuff it's all kinds yeah i agree andrew what do you think the only thing Don't i would make change. here i would put dark knight rises over dunkirk personally um i no. i just think it is more forgivable for a movie to start really gripping and then lose you. You know, you have the plane scene at the beginning of Dark Knight Rises, as opposed to the other way when you don't get grabbed right away and then you have to kind of like earn your attention. So I think that's why for me, Dark Knight Rises is slightly higher for me. That's a yeah. good call, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> what a surprise. <laughs> Yeah, for me, uh, personally, I would bump Memento into the top three. I feel like it's such an impressive uh, and original script uh, that has, you know, it's a pretty, it's not a, I wouldn't call it a bare bones budget, but compared to the other <laughs> mega films that we have uh, on this list and coming up, I think uh, what they're able to do with uh, such a comparatively small budget, it all really comes from a place of feeling and vision. Um, and I, I love this movie, this is one of my favorites. That's what I would bump up. But this is not our show, this is the fans show and I wanna know what's in our top three. So please, let's see what we have in our number three spot. Aha! Oh. <laughs> I'm where Matthew McConaughey is crying. And today I'm the age you were when you left. <laughs> Murph! <laughs> Murph! <laughs> Are you guys surprised to see this at number three? I, for one, am not. Yeah, I think this is probably appropriate. I think when you look at the most nolan nolan movies you think interstellar <laughs> as like yes this is that space drama it's so fun it's so creative it looks great uh it just didn't rock the industry like the other two films i suspect are here are here but uh of in terms of guy goes into space to confront his family and or daddy issues i think this is top tier space movie space <laughs> movie you know, we had a we had a user uh, leave a comment that I thought was really cool. Storm Warden sixty twelve said, "Interstellar is so good, especially with the science involved. It's so good that we watched it in my astronomy class and used it as a full lesson on how various things work, mainly black holes." And I think, like within like the Nolan action emotion um, kind of dynamic that he's he's so good at cultivating, there is a real like scientific backbone to this movie that I think lends it a lot of credibility um, outside of how much you connect or don't with the story. Um, I rewatched re this um, when we were getting ready for, for the show. It was a movie that I myself had never connected with that much, but after seeing the, the overwhelming love from the fans and people were raving about this movie, how much, how they were touched by it, how they loved the science of it. Um, I went back to it and you know what? Like, I think I, I've been converted. I, I'm an interstellar <laughs> <laughs> and now it's uh it's beautiful it's huge it's so big this story um and there are so many really impactful scenes throughout that are not just action not just emotion but really powerfully cross the two um this is a banger <laughs> it's shall we see number two yeah let's go what do we got Mm. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Another in something movie. Inception. Now, before you bother telling me it's impossible. It no, it's perfectly possible. It's just bloody difficult. This is, yeah, I mean, I, I cannot argue with this top three so far. Um, I yeah. mean, I, I think in terms of uh, uh, practicality of the effects, uh, I think Christopher Nolan really outdid himself with this one. Uh, I mean, I, I could watch that featurette of them filming the hallway sequence like a hundred times and it never gets old. Um, but it's not just that, it's also just a very well-crafted story. Uh, I mean, like the, the level of detail that has to be put into it to think, okay, this is the mechanics of this dream world and the next dream world, how that affects the next one. Uh, it feels like he's playing 4D chess, both visually and narratively, and it does not miss. Yeah, totally agree. I remember seeing this in the theater for the first time and thinking like, I've never seen a movie like this. There might not be another movie like this. Um, it's just high level on all fronts. Um, as you said, it, it does not miss. It really, it goes for it. He goes for it 100%. The budget, the visuals, like the, the cast, um, it's such an ambitious project and it just nails it. What do you think, Andrew? He incepted the idea that every Hollywood trailer should have big air. <laughs> That's how powerful <laughs> this movie is. But I, I think it's such a great, it, it's such a colorful cast. The, like, he always has crews of thieves, but this was, everyone had such a specific role and specialty, the graphics, the perfect amount of Michael Caine. 
in the narrative. It, it just had such a creative idea of diving into dreams, wondering if you're awake and asleep, and probably one of the greatest endings of the 21st century, oh. period. <laughs> The top, the, it's real, guys. It's real, all right. The top wobbler, wobbled or whatever. I think it. I think it's real. Is it? Is it? Yeah, yeah, it's real. <laughs> we had our time together, and I have to let you go. All right, let's see number one. What have the fans chosen? Tenant. No. <laughs> Whoa, not Tenant. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think there's no surprise here. Um, I In my head, I was like, it's between Inception and the Dark Knight. I'm not surprised to see this at number one. You either die a hero or you live long enough to see yourself become the villain. This is the one. <laughs> I mean, this was pretty obvious, I think. Um, <laughs> I think what sets apart, because I was really thinking about what sets apart this movie from all its other ones, and I really think it's the villain. I think Christopher Nolan puts these great, like, man versus environment, man versus conceptual ideas really well. But this is a movie where the villain has that same weight, that same development as the hero, combined with all the other Christopher Nolan trademarks of heist, steals, men's, men in suit, Michael Caine. It has it all. And I think it really just grasped on and it's probably still one of the greatest, if not the greatest superhero movie of all time. And I think like looking at the, I think we can look to, I mean, Batman Begins, but also I think the Dark Knight is really the turning point for like cinema, like the where we're at right now in terms of Hollywood and like the, the superhero explosion. Like you made a point earlier, Tim, about how everyone has been kind of trying to, to touch this magic and, uh, you know, the MCU, there's, you know, there's without getting into everything. But I think we can look at this as a turning point of where suddenly this, this resulted in this enormous genre explosion that we're still living in. Um, morally ambiguous superheroes with this kind of dark, gritty relationship to the city. Um, is there a better superhero movie than this? I think the I don't know. pretty obvious. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, it's Morbius, guys. What are you talking about? Intriguing. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, why'd it take you so long? It's more than time, every day. Well, yeah, I mean, the one thing the Dark Knight is missing is when the Joker looks in the camera and says, it's joking time. Because, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, and it, but I think, like, this movie is, even without Ledger's Joker, is iconic, iconic, iconic. But it's also, like, he's so believable in the world that Nolan creates that someone like this could exist. Um, and this constant tension between good and evil and the des desire to do what's what's right and wrong. And then you have this character who does not care about right or wrong, even in, in the slightest. It's just simply, some men want to watch the world burn. Um, this is an incredible movie. I'm not surprised to see this at one. I'm delighted, um, honestly. Yeah. Because he's not a hero. He's a silent guardian. A watchful protector. A dark knight. That's Here it is. <laughs> yeah. That's, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there's nothing I would change in my in my own personal rank. I would I would put Inception maybe above the Dark Knight. That's just my own personal feeling. Put Memento a little higher, but I'm not surprised by this rank. I think this represents <laughs> uh, the the cultural feeling about about this filmography. Any thoughts on Tenet? Since that is uh, the one <laughs> Nolan movie, not besides Oppenheimer, that we have not included, that did not make the rank. Well, I guess if people like movies they can hear, I can understand mm. why Tenet was <laughs> left off the list. <laughs> the talkies. <laughs> the cause comes before effect. No, that's just the way we see time. All right, so here is our rank. Thank you to all of our fans. Uh, this looks fantastic. I'm, I'm not surprised to see it. I, it's pretty similar to what I would have done myself. So the people know what's up. You're either die a hero or you live long enough. See yourself become the villain. I can do those things. 
All right. So thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Tim. And thank you to our special guest, Nick. This was an absolute delight and a pleasure. And a very special thank you to all of our fans who joined into the conversation, who left votes, who left comments. It's always so much fun when we get to engage with you guys, see what you think. Uh, the show wouldn't be possible without you. So don't forget to let us know what you think in the comments, if you love this rank, if you hate this rank, and be sure to let us know where you think Oppenheimer fits in. Uh, happy Barbenheimer weekend to all, and we'll see you next time.